All right, we've been talking about the victorious life. Say yes, we have. Amen. And uh, wanted to just, uh, this will be our last week of that, and then we're going to get into uh, Easter message and and uh, and so on. I'm not even going to, it's like I want to tell you all kinds of stuff about that. It's kind of been, I've been studying it, and it's been growing in me, and it's like, I w- I'd rather, I think I'd just rather just shift right over and preach that, but I need to finish this. And the one thing that, that helps me to stay here is that I get to preach about faith. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> because one of my favorite subjects to preach, uh, because it's the one thing that will that has transformed my life is, is operating and living by faith. And I know it will transform other people's lives. And that's why our mission statement for Faith Connection is to help people live a life of faith in God. That if we can help people do that, we know that they can have the victorious life and that they can have an abundant life. So you got your Bibles? Go to 1 John. I know you do. 1 John in chapter 2. And we'll take a look at uh, Scripture here. So I wanted to kind of answer the question, well, when we're talking about the victorious life, the victorious Christian life, what are we talking about? What does it mean to live a victorious life? So 1 John chapter 2, and verse, starting in verse 15, it says, Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world is passing away, and the lust of it. But he who does the will of God abides forever. So we know that the victorious life, abiding forever in God, is, is our, the ultimate goal, let's say, for a victorious life. But we can have a victorious life now, today, while we're here on this earth. It's not just for the sweet by and by whenever we go to be with him. But we can have this victorious life and we can have it as being triumphant over the, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the, of the eyes, and the pride of life. So those three things, we kind of, this word lust, we kind of use it in a sexual context and it's not just that. The lust of the flesh is that, you know, our flesh is very loud. You know, did you ever notice that? It wants what it wants now. And it is very demanding and very loud about those things. And so our spirit man, our inner man, the, 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 our spirit man, the man, you know, our heart is not that uh, demanding and that boisterous and that um, loud. But our flesh will just kick up a foot. It's like a two-year-old or a four-year-old that just doesn't get their way. They're going to throw themselves down and throw a fit. And if it's the worst place that, <laughs> that will embarrass mom the most, they're going to throw the even bigger fit and the worst fit. If they're in the middle of Walmart and they want something, they're going to make sure everybody in the store knows it. And our flesh is just like that. You know, I, I know mine loves, you know, chocolate. <laughs> I'm a chocolate guy. You, you ask me what I want for cake and ice cream. I want chocolate cake with chocolate ice cream, icing and chocolate ice cream. And it's like apple pie. The only thing that goes with apple pie is chocolate ice cream. I mean, vanilla, don't even bother. You know, so I, I like my chocolate but I know it's not good for me to eat chocolate all the time. And so the other thing that my, my flesh really likes is sugar and salt and all those things that doctors you stay away from those things. You know, when we were teenagers and 20s and stuff like that, you know, we could, we could get away with that. But the older I get, the less I can get away with it. And so I've got to make sure that I moderate that. And I'm getting to the point where I need to totally eliminate it. And uh, sugar is the, is the food of cancer, they tell us, that, you know, if, if you have, you know, cancer cells and things in your body, that sugar is a, is a major food for cancer. Salt is a major thing to, to mess up your blood pressure and your heart and all, you know, just all the stuff that we know. You know, I'm not telling you anything we don't know. And it, it's like, but our flesh wants all that stuff. And so this, this, uh, the, the, uh, lust of the flesh is not a, not just a lusting after someone 
sexually, but it's also all these other things in our life that, we, that our flesh really wants and really desires, and we know it's not good for us, but we, if we keep giving into the flesh, the flesh will just keep being more and more demanding. That's the thing. The, the flesh never gets satisfied. It never says enough. The, the, there's a scripture that tells us that, you know, it's like fire. It's like, I'm trying to think of what the other things are. Huh. You know, the fire never says that it, that it has enough fuel. It has enough wood. No, it just keeps consuming everything that it can. And that's the way our flesh is. It never says, okay, I've had enough. No, it says, I want more. Even when we are at the point of literally uh, overload, it just says, uh, that's too bad. Just take more, 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 more. I want more, I want more. And so that the, the, um, the lust of the flesh is, is, is what we're talking about. The lust of the eyes, this is not just, you know, having lustful thoughts about someone of the opposite sex or even of the same sex, and people have all kinds of things and issues, but, um, you know, it's not just those kind of things, though that's part of it, but the other thing is shiny and new. You know, we love things that are shiny and new. You go to the grocery store or to the, or to the department store, and at the cash register, there's all those things in that when you're in line, there's all this stuff beside you. Why do they put that stuff there? That's the lust of the eye. You know, it's something that, ooh, that would be nice. Ooh, that would be nice. And the markup on those items that are in there is, you know, eight, nine hundred percent. I mean, it's all that stuff in there is like marked up to the max because it's impulse buying, they call it. Not just in the in the main aisles and the, you know, the the uh, retailers or um, people that manufacture the products, they want the end of the row. They don't want to be in that great big long row somewhere in the middle of all that. No, they want to be on the end where, we're, where they're seen and where they're out in front of people. Why? Because when you see something, your lust of your eye wants it and your flesh says, I want that. And so these are the things that, that we need to overcome. And having the victorious life is having control of these things, is having control of what we allow our flesh to have. And I'm like spending way too much time here. Let's go to John 14, 27. Another thing that the victorious life is, you know, it's, first thing we talked about was it's, it's living a life that is, that is triumphs over the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. And I didn't even really get into the pride of life, but we'll keep moving here. John 14, 27. John 14, 27. It says, peace I leave with you. This, if you've got a red letter edition, we're reading let red. What does that mean? It's Jesus talking. He's speaking to us. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give you, give to you. Let not your heart be troubled, nor let it be afraid. So this victorious life is to conquering fear and knowing and experiencing the peace of God. That's the two things that we need to understand, that it's not just dealing with fear management, you know what I mean, and just trying to deal with being afraid of whatever, of, the, of not having enough money or being afraid that, that that pain or that um, symptom that you have in your body, it may be something or, you know, is that fear that maybe I won't, uh, I won't have enough to get by or a fear that, you know, the relationship's going bad and, you know, just kind of fears about those kind of things. That's not the end of it. The next thing is to know that we have the peace of God and living in that peace. So that's what the victorious life is about. Go to Romans 8.35. I got to speed up. Romans 8:35. It says, "Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or or nakedness or peril or sword?" This is to under, you know, I chose this scripture to that we persevere through these things. This is what the victorious life does. Even when we go through these things, even when we go through trouble or hardship, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword, when we go through those kind of things, we're not allowing them to 
take us down, but we know that we will be victorious over them. It may be, you know, this too shall pass kind of thing. You know, it's a temporary situation that we're in, and this will pass, and we will go through. And not only will we go through it, but we'll come out the other end victorious, better off than we went into that, into that problem. 1 Corinthians 15. And I know for a lot of people, they, they, uh, they look at us Christians and go, you know, you guys are just delusional. You know, you just, you just think that no matter what happens, everything's going to be okay and you'll make it through. Yeah, I hate to say it, but yes, that's exactly what we believe. Because if we don't believe that, we're not believing the word of God because that's what God has declared that if we will trust him and if we'll have confidence in him, that he will not only uh, get us through it alive, but he'll get it through us even stronger than when we went into the problem, then we can trust him for that and we can receive that. 1 Corinthians 15, starting in 54, if I can find it here. We ready? This is a little few verses here, so be patient. So, so when so when this corruptible has put on incorruption, and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written: Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your sting? O Hades, where is your victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, <laughs> who has given us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. And so these kind of things is what the victorious life is. It's not, you know, beds of roses and, you know, sunshine and and tea and crumpet, and I'm just trying to think of all the, all the good things. Um, you know, uh, it's not just everything being calm and no, no worries or no, no uh, things that are going on in our life, but it is knowing that we are going through that and we're coming out the other side. It's knowing that, you know, that um, the one scripture says that though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. How can we do that? How can we walk through literally the, the worst situation in our life and say, I have no fear. I'm not going to be afraid of this situation. I'm not going to be afraid of no man, but I'm going to go through this and be victorious. It's because God has promised us and he will give us the victorious life. You know, we've been talking about the last couple of weeks about Okay, how do we get this? And we, we looked at where Jesus told us, how do we obtain this victorious life? Is that, number one, we must have faith in God. That this uh, victorious life, we're not going to do it. We're not going to have it doing it man's way. That man's way of doing things is not good. Jesus said that, you know, with man, this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. So we know that with man, man's way of doing things, man's way of thinking, the, the natural earthly way of accomplishing things, you are not going to have the victorious life that you want. But if we do it God's way and we think his way and we do it his way, if we speak his language and his way of speaking, then we can have that victorious life that he's called us to. The, the, the first thing that Jesus told us that we needed to do in Mark 11, 22, is that we must have faith in God. We can't not just have faith in him that he will do it, but then we go into other verses or other uh, translations of this verse, and it says, have the God kind of faith. We need to have God's kind of faith in us, and that is that when we speak and when we declare something, we got to believe that it's going to happen and we're going to, it's going to cause to come. And that's what Jesus was telling us to do. you got to have the faith of God and you got to have faith in God. That he's the one that's going to do the work, but you're the one that's going to have the victorious life. You know what I mean? So often we think, well, okay, God, do it. You know, give me the victorious life. And it's like you've got to do the work of faith and believe him that, he can, that it will be accomplished in your life. So... Um, 
We know that, that it, without faith, it's impossible to please God. We know that, that, um, that God commanded his, his people, his children, to live a life of faith. You know, the just shall live by faith, that, that it's a lifestyle that we've got to live. And if we're not willing to give up the, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes, and we're, and we're willing to, if we're not willing to do that and to take on the lifestyle of a believer, the lifestyle of faith, then we're not going to have the victorious life. But I can guarantee you this, if you step up and say, I'm going to do this, I'm going to take on a lifestyle of faith, of believing God, to get in his word, to, to you know, find out what his promises are for me, and then live like those are true. That means that I speak that way. I think that way. I plan my schedule that way. I talk to others that way. That's how we are going to live a life of faith in God. All right. Um, you know, the... the um, 1 John uh, 5 and 4, it, it tells us that this is the victory that overcomes the world, our faith, or some translations say your faith. It's your faith that is the victory that overcomes the world. This is how we accomplish the, the, the victorious life that we want. This is how we get the good stuff. This is how we get the peace of God that just, we don't, we don't understand it, you know, out here, everything's just chaos, but in here we have absolute peace because we know our God. We know Him. If um, the, do you ever find, do you ever meet people that are joyful? But I'm not saying about slap happy. You know, there's kind of weird people that are just slap happy all the time, you know. You know, you could slap them and they're still happy. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about joy. You know what I mean? You know, you slap them and they're going to be like, you know, hey, what's going on? Why are you doing that? And they're going to get a frown on their face. And they're going to, I might have to slap you back, you know, and they might. But yet there's this joy in them that even when things aren't good, when things aren't going right, that, that there's a joy just and that. You, you realize that that joy that's in them is producing strength in them, strength of character, strength of their will, strength of their of controlling their their emotions and their and their mouth, you know, that's the biggest area we need to control is our mouth, what's coming out of it. And so that joy is your strength to be able to do those things. And it, it's going to take your faith to accomplish those things. So we understand that having the victorious life is completely wrapped up in having faith and understanding faith. So let's, uh, you know, we looked at um, Mark eleven twenty two when Jesus says, have faith in God, have the God kind of faith. And so I wanted to go on and go down through the rest of the verses there in Mark 11 and talk about, okay, Jesus is giving us, not only does he say, have faith in God, but then he says, okay, this is how it works. This is how you do that. This is how it accomplishes. In the next few verses, he gives us these answers. So in Mark 11 and 23, I want to look at all these in the New Living Translation not because it's uh, words it any differently, but because it uh, puts it into a, a, an English that I can understand <laughs> or an English that makes a little more sense to me. So in uh, Mark eleven twenty two, 22, Jesus answered and said to them, said to his disciples, have faith in God. Verse 23, it says, I tell you the truth. So when Jesus speaks, we kind of go, okay, this is truth. But then he says, but I'm telling you the truth. And that is he, he's not only is it his character and who he is that gives us confidence that what he's going to say is the truth, but then he tells us, I'm going to tell you the truth. You can say to this mountain, may you be lifted up and thrown into the sea, and it will happen. <laughs> is that just, I always love reading red scriptures. I always love reading if you've got a red-letter edition Bible and it's the words of Christ, him speaking, it's plain, simple, straightforward. He doesn't mix anything with it. He doesn't embellish it. He, he doesn't try to, you know, uh, sugarcoat it or, you know, dumb it down or simplify it. Or he just point blank says it. It's good for me to be able to do that same thing. 
He just point blank says this is the way it is. If you tell this mountain to be lifted up and be thrown into the sea, and it will happen. But you must really believe it will happen and have no doubt in your heart. So this is the first condition to have faith in God, and you can move mountains. If you have faith in God and you have the God kind of faith and you put it to work and you speak, your, you speak what it is you want, you tell the mountain to move, then it will move, but you must have really, you must really believe. And this goes right along with our, with our vision statement for faith connection. You know, real people, real answers, real, you know, <laughs> real people, real life, real answers. Thanks, Dan, you messed me up. <laughs> you know, <laughs> Every once in a while, we twist them around. Okay, real life, real people. Real, no, real people, real life, real answers. It's on there. Read it right there. All right. Um, so this real faith that we have to have will is how we can have these things, how we can be real people, how, how we can be um, real in our faith, real in our, in our relationship with God. We don't come in with... Uh, with a mask on, with, you know, all dressed up and looking good, but we come to God real as who we are. And, and we do that by faith. He's told us to live a life of faith, and we got to have the real, we got to have real faith. You know, and it's the, when we say we live real life, we're not, you know, a lot of, I see this a lot in people. They want to have it all together and, and so if they're church folks, they want to have it all together, like, oh, we, we have all of our, you know, all of our finances are good, our relationships are good, or physically we're healed, and we're walking in divine health, and, you know, they, they want to be all put together and all good. Well, that ain't real life, is it? I mean, that can be for a season, and, and I love it when I'm in those seasons, when everything's, you know, looking good and does good and is good. But I know that, that that's not, you know, life happens and things don't go right. And, and that it's going to be, I don't want to, I feel like I'm prophesying that bad things are going to happen. I'm not. It's just what life is. You know what I mean? Life is life and things, we go through stuff. And yet that's where, why we need faith if, if we got born again and then all, you know, from then on, everything was perfect. Everything was good. You're physically well. Your finances are all in order. Your relationships just keep getting better and better. Your, you know, whatever. Your mental state is just keeps getting stronger and stronger. You know, if, if that was the case, we wouldn't need faith. We wouldn't need the, the promises of God. We wouldn't need all the encouragement from the word to telling us don't fear don't worry, don't be, have anxiety, don't, you know, we wouldn't need any of that because it's all going to be good. We're going to get up tomorrow and it's just be, be, it's going to be a little bit better than it was yesterday. And that's not reality, is it? You know, we can go through seasons of that, but we're not going to live in that state over, you know, day after day after day after day. I'm going to smash my, my thumb with a hammer again. <laughs> this week I smashed my arm. I hit myself in the arm with a hammer. And it's like, <laughs> what is that? You know, and it's like, why do those things happen? Well, you know, if you're doing anything, think, you know, mistakes are going to happen or it's a momentary lapse in concentration <laughs> is what I always call it. You just momentarily, you know, you're thinking about something else and you think you're just going at it and Wham, you know, anyhow. But a lot of times it's you're holding something and somebody else is swinging a hammer and you're going to get hit. You know, somebody else is, and here's the, you know, that's, that's an analogy is here's what they're doing is that they're slinging their words around and they're going to hurt you. They're, they're saying stuff that is going to hurt you. They're saying stuff that they truly don't mean, that they don't want to be rude, they don't want to be harsh or anything, but yet they still are. And you take it that way, and it hurts, and it, you know, hurts your little emotions and your little ego, and you know, it it rubs you the wrong way. And I know I have an ability to do that with people. I'm I'm like 40 grit sandpaper. Sometimes I just rub people raw, and I don't mean to do that. I don't mean to, you know, be 
that that way. I want to I want to be silk, you know. I want to be you know felt and just be nice and soft and fuzzy and you know with everybody. But but I don't always do that, do I? Everybody say no, Pastor, you do not. <laughs> um, and so it's it's you know life is going to happen with those things. And one time I I was dealing with one of my neighbors, not my neighbors where I live, but a neighbor at one of our uh, buildings that we owned. And I thought I'd be nice and plow off their driveway, which is a real short little driveway. And I thought, well, I'll just push off the worst of it. And my tire went up onto the driveway, and it crushed down all the snow. And made, you, know, you can't plow that off. It made this line of snow that just embedded. You know what I mean when you drive over snow, and it makes a line. And he came out and gave it to me. What am I going to do with that? How am I going to get that off of there? And I'm like, I was trying to be nice and plow. You know, I did two-thirds or 80% of the work of clearing your driveway of snow. And, yeah, I left this little, and I thought, well, oh, never again. I'm not going to mow, you're not going to plow your driveway. Then later I find out, like that summer I find out, that He's dealing with cancer. He's an older gentleman. In fact, he had passed away probably before the next winter. And he was dealing with cancer. He's, you know, at the end of his life. He's at the worst place. And it just was a bad day for him. You know, and, and I had, you know, I had to straighten myself out. You know, when I find that out, I look back on that conversation, interaction. I'm like, Lord, forgive me for how I took, I took that bad. My little heart was hurt. My little emotions were hurt. And I was not happy, camper, how he kind of attacked me, you know. And, and we don't know what people are going through and what they're dealing with. And, you know, thankfully, I got a, an opportunity to witness to him. He was a, he's a Christian. He'd been a Christian for years. I got to, you know, encourage him with, you know, the the fact that healing's available to him. He had way too much religion in him to receive it in a short period of time. That was going to take a long time, a lot of teaching, a lot of showing him the scripture to, to overcome all those years. You know, that his saying was, I don't smoke or chew and I don't run with those or do, and why am I dealing with this cancer? Why do I have to deal with this? I've lived my life good, the best that I could. Now, why am I dealing with this cancer? And, you know, it... it it would have taken years, literally, of speaking the word into him day after day after day for him to receive his healing. And so I got to pray for him. I got to believe with him. I got to see him, you know, improve some, you know, before he passed away. And, you know, a couple of things that were really chronic and really bad, you know, to, to see that subside for him. He had enough faith to, to believe that God could do that and, and he could receive that, that element of, of healing in his body. And, and then he passed away. And, you know, it just like, but we can, this is where, where faith has to really have, the, where the rubber meets the road with faith, is that our faith is in, is in the, that God is the one who um, cares for us. He's the one that, that can heal our Broken heart can heal our, our bruised ego, our bruised emotions. He's the one that can take care of those things. we got to not try to remedy everything that goes on in our life. Say amen with that. All right. But in this uh, Mark eleven twenty three, 23, it says, I tell you the truth, you can say to this mountain, faith is voice activated. That's how your voice is engaged. That's how it, how it is put into motion, you know, it's like a, um, it's like your car, you know, you, some of us uh, still stick a key in the ignition and turn it, other ones just push a button and, you know, and start the car, but there's something that engages, that something that starts that engine, that gets it going, and so what starts faith, what engages faith is your voice, it is the word you speak, and so if you're speaking, uh, negative, harsh things like, you know, I'll never get out of debt. Uh, I'm probably going to die of this symptom that I have in my body. You know, you're, you're speaking all these things. Then you're speaking life into that. Well, I want to speak life with my faith. I want to speak life into, into my body that I am I'm healed of the Lord, that the, 
that the stripes of Jesus have healed me, that not only am I healed, but I was healed. You know, that 2,000 years ago, Jesus paid the price, and therefore that's when my healing was initiated and was started, and now I'm ready to receive my, my healing. All right, same way you did salvation. That's how you got salvation. 2,000 years ago, Jesus paid for it. It was accomplished. It was done. And the day you finally came to him and said, I received my salvation and got born again, that's when you were saved. You know, the same thing, way it works for your, for your physical healing, for your financial provision and supply, it, it works the same way for everything. All right, let's go to Mark eleven twenty four. It says, I tell you, you can pray for anything. <laughs> There's scripture after scripture after scripture of Jesus saying this. John 10.10, 10, if you ask me anything, I will do it. <laughs> if you ask according to my name, I will do it. And he, and he says this over and over and over again. He says, I tell you, you can pray for anything. And if you believe that you've received it, it will be yours. And so this connection between praying and we're, what are we doing when we pray? We're using our voice. We're speaking. We're activating our faith. We're using our voice. Faith is voice activated. But the, the next thing is that we, how we need to speak is in prayer. We speak in prayer. We ask in prayer. This is a, a huge thing for, for Christians that have been in church all their life, sat in the pews, raised their hands, have just been there week after week after week, is that they get so accustomed to the, the, the kingdom of God and to the things of God that they don't ask. And this is such a, 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 an important element of how we activate our faith and how we use our faith and how we're going to have the victorious life is that we need to ask in prayer. We need to go before the Lord and ask him for the things that we have need of. And that asking in prayer, we've got to take the context that who's speaking this, it's Jesus. And how did he teach how to pray? He taught us to pray the, 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 um, the you know, the, what are they, what's it called? The, um, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. The Lord's Prayer. Jeez. <laughs> Sometimes, you know, you just kind of like, it's up there. Come on. You know, you're flipping through the cards and you, you just can't seem to come up with it. Anyhow, he taught us how to pray through the Lord's Prayer. And he taught us, he taught, you know, he spoke to the disciples many times about how to pray. He talked to the people that were following him and, and how he taught and told parables and all that. And he taught people how to pray. And so there is so much scripture on how to pray that, that are literally the words of Jesus. They're in red if you've got a red letter edition Bible. And, and so we've got to understand that when Jesus says you ask in prayer, then you need to ask in, in a, in a con and, oh, I don't want to say this. We need, I want to, it's not hard. It's, I, I want to, there's no formula to it. And I, and I don't want to mean to, to do that. But Jesus taught us how to pray, and we need to pray the way he taught us to. We pray in faith. We pray in his name. We pray in the will of God. We pray according to his uh, leading and his direction. You know, we pray these ways in, 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 this, in this way. And so we use our faith to pray and to ask for things. But we need to pray and ask. We need to ask in prayer, believing so that you believe that when you pray, you receive it. Because you can pray this way. Oh, Lord, boy, I really, really, really need, I really, I really would like, I, you know, is there any way that you can accomplish this or give me this or do this? And we don't really believe. But believing when we pray is saying, Lord, 1 Peter 2.24 says that by your stripes I'm healed. Isaiah 53 says that by your stripes we were healed, that we are healed and we were healed, therefore we, we is healed. And so when we, when we take those kind of scriptures and we go to the Lord and he says, come to me boldly, come into, the king, come into my throne room with boldness, into his courts with praise, and we come in giving him honor and thanks. And we say, Lord, 
I believe what you said. I believe what your word says. And Lord, I receive my healing now. I receive it because I'm asking for it and I receive it. And so this um, asking is one thing, but then you've got to believe that, you're gonna, you're, that, you, that you have it because you've asked for it. All right. In, uh, that was Mark 24, yes. Mark uh, 25 and 26. Here's another important part of, you know, faith is required for us to live this victorious life. We need to have the faith of God. We need to understand that faith is voice activated. It's how we put our faith into motion, that we ask in prayer, believing that we receive it. You know, receiving something is, just think of it as somebody giving you a gift, that they're offering you a gift, and you receive it, you take it, you possess it, you obtain it. And so that's what we need to do in prayer. When we ask for something, when we ask from God, we need to then receive it. So what you did in salvation, you did it, you, you did it so well when you got born again. You, you know what I mean? We all received the, the, the greatest miracle that there ever is, and that is the miracle of salvation. We did that when we prayed and we said, Lord, I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. I believe that he died on the cross for my sins, and now I receive my salvation. So God was standing there offering us salvation. He paid the price on the cross. He did everything he needed to do, offering it to us freely out of grace. And so now we, we need to take it. We need to obtain it. We need to possess it. We need to put it into our life and put it into practice and, and, and live it and have it. That's what receiving is. And, then we, and, and that is the act of believing. When we believe, we receive. All right. In uh, verse 25 and 26, I don't even have, oh, and we're doing it out of the New Living Translation. That's why I don't even have my Bible turned to it. <laughs> Verses 25 and 26. But when you are praying, Jesus didn't say if you pray or, you know, if you get around to it. No, he says, when you are praying. This is what I love about, about the, the word of God is that, you know, the just shall live by faith. In other words, the children of God is commanded that we shall live by faith. We must live by faith. And we know that there's Old Testament scripture that say that exact same thing. There's New Testament scripture that say the exact same thing, word for word, the just shall live by faith. And so this principle or this I call it a, um, uh, you know, our, it's like tithing and fasting and praying and, you know, they're religious or they're our Christian, uh, are not duties, and they're not suggestions, they're commands. <laughs> you shall do these things. There are practices. It's what we practice. It's what we do. It's, it's our, our, it's got to be our, our lifestyle and our culture. It's got to be who we are and what we do. When, when, when people uh, call you at a certain time of day, they know or people know not to call you that time of day because you're going to be praying, you know, or you're going to be in church or you're going to be, you know, doing whatever it is that, that your lifestyle is. And so uh, living by faith or using your faith to receive things from God has got, is, is a command. It's not just suggestion like, you, you know, hopefully you'll use a little bit of God kind of faith and get something. That's not what Jesus said. Jesus said, have faith in God. Not if you, you know, at least trust him a little bit. No, he said, have it, possess it, take, take, take it on. All right. So this, uh, this uh, Mark eleven twenty five. 25, it says, but when you are praying... First, forgive anyone you are holding a grudge against so that your Father in heaven will forgive your sins too. So I kind of came to a realization of something. Holding a grudge? We've never done any of that, have we? No. no. Okay, I'm the only one. Uh, okay, I'm sorry. I, I was thinking maybe that was a common human trait that we hold grudges against people when they do bad to us. We kind of like, oh, I'm going to get you, you know, revenge is going to be sweet, you know, and, and we, we think all these things. And yet 
Scripture tells us that's not the way to do it. That's not the way you're going to have faith, and that's not the way you're going to have the victorious life that you want. How you're going to do it is that you're going to do it because you first forgive. First. <laughs> this is, these are the, the fight of faith. This is the walk of faith that we've got to go through. These are the things that we need to do is first we've got to overcome our wants, our, you know, our, we love to hold a grudge. We love to, you know, pay somebody back when they do us wrong. Mm, okay, that's just me. Okay, but when you are praying, first forgive. First forgive anyone, not all of them but that one. You know, forgive all the little ones, but not the big one. You know, forgive everyone that's, you know, all that tri trivial stuff. Forgive all that. But man, that one thing, he said that just the wrong way to me, and he didn't even shake my hand. He didn't, you know what I mean? That one person, that one thing. No, first, forgive anyone you are holding a grudge against so that your Father in heaven will forgive your sins too. So that kind of tells me that holding a grudge is sin, is it not? Because I got to forgive. And the Father's going to forgive me for my sin, which is holding a grudge. Oof. That's why I like the New Living Translation. Let's go to verse 25. We need to forgive. This is an important part of living a victorious life. This is an important part of having a lifestyle of faith. This is a, a crucial element to having the good life, the, the good Christian life that we want to have. So this is verse uh, 26, where we're going, right? Verse 26, you don't have one, do you? <laughs> I tricked you. I psyched him out. The New Living Translation, there's many, um, I'll explain this. Of course, in the King James and the New King James, verse 26 is there. But there's many uh, transcripts, writings or whatever that eliminated or did not include verse 26. And so... Even in my New King James Bible that has 26, in my margin notes, it gives me a note that says, in some transcripts, 26 is eliminated, is not there. But let me read it to you. And, and it's funny, in the New Living Translation, they give you uh, a, a footnote that 26 is eliminated, but then they give you the verse. So <laughs> they do give it to you, actually, in the New Living let me read it to you. It says, but if you refuse to forgive, your Father in heaven will not forgive your sins. If we know that we have an area in our life and we're going to prayer, we're activating our faith, we're saying, God, I want to live the good life. I want to live this victorious life and I want to have all these things. And, and Lord, I, I know that they will, they will add to me and now I'll be able to to be in abundance, a blessing to other people in abundance, and I'll be able to do things. And, and God, I know it's not just about me. It's about everybody else in my life as well. And, you know, we're believing this, but we won't forgive. Then God cannot forgive us. And if he cannot forgive us, what does that do? That puts a separation between us, between us and God, that separates us from him is unforgiveness, him unable to forgive us. It's not that God won't forgive us, it's that he can't. He can't forgive someone that's holding a grudge. He can't forgive someone who is maintaining known sin. That's the best way I know how to say it. That if we, are, uh, if we have known sin in our life, sin that we, stuff that we know that is sin in our life, then he can't forgive us and he cannot bring into our life the blessings that he has for us. He says, uh, it says, but if you refuse to forgive, and that, that word refuse is important in this scripture. It's not that you can't. It's not that you're w not working on it. It's not that you're getting yourself to that point of forgiving someone. Sometimes forgiveness is a process. You know, when somebody slap, you know, slaps you silly with their mouth, you know, with their words, and they're just heart hurtful and, and just heart wrenching kind of stuff that someone does to you, it, is, it, it takes a process of getting to that point where you can forgive them. And so it's, it's not that you are not working on forgiving them, it's that you refuse to forgive them. 
And if you get it in your heart that you are going to hold a grudge and you're going to hold them accountable and, and you're refusing to forgive them, then your Father in heaven will not forgive your sins. Ooh. Amen. Thank God. Everybody okay? That's rough. I mean, uh, you know, I'm standing up here with my toes all curled up saying, Lord, okay, enough, enough, enough. You know, so stop beating that, beating that horse, you know. I understand. I get it. I get it. I, get it. I want to talk about all the great things of faith. I want to talk about how, how much we can get through faith, how we can receive the goodness of God and all the, all the blessings of God by faith. And we can do all these things. And then he goes, if you don't use your faith to forgive, then I can't forgive you. And that's where this act of faith, this living by faith, this literally believing that you can get, that you will have your sins forgiven and then receiving that forgiveness requires us to forgive others. You must do it. All right. Everybody okay? Everybody good? All right. So if we want to have the victorious life, what do we need to do? We need to understand that faith is voice activated. We need to get our mouth in gear. We need to get our mouth right, saying the right things and, do, and, and pr proclaiming and professing the right things. We need to, um, I got to look at my notes again now. I forget what the second one was. We need to ask in prayer. <laughs> Isn't that funny how you just bring it? <laughs> we need to ask in prayer. And in asking, we need to believe that we receive it when we pray. Say amen. And we need to forgive. We need to forgive those that have wronged us. We need to forgive those that have, uh, you know, anyone that we have a, a, an issue with, a problem with, we need to be, we need to forgive them. 